Among the many cool things that I get to do in this position is to welcome uh, distinguished guests like Dr. Charles Hughes. Um, Dr. Hughes is a historian uh, on the faculty at Rhodes College over in Memphis, where he's also director of the Memphis Center. And of course, he is the author of this very fine and much lauded book, Country Soul, Making Music and Making Race in the American South. And that's what he's going to talk to us about today. No further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Charles Hughes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this is such a, I don't need to tell you all how wonderful this, this, this center is and how wonderful and important the work that y'all here do, um, but it's just it's just wonderful to be here as part of this community of people uh, interested in thinking about music and thinking about why music um, matters uh, as we think about uh, history and other things. So I want to today just kind of talk about the book a bit, talk about it, um, kind of give you a general overview, talk about a few of the specific stories within it. Uh, I also think that, at least as far as I'm concerned, the best part of any of these kinds of talks are the Q&A, so I'm going to try to be conscious of time so that we have plenty of time for conversation. Mm -hmm. Worth hearing, and in fact, near the end, uh, the, the red-headed guitar player actually speaks. Uh, Lattimore has a spoken section in which he talks about uh, his, how he feels whenever he plays this music. He just begins to wonder about his own, uh, his mm -hmm. own identity. It's a really amazing track. And although when released in 1975, it was only a minor hit, uh, although it is worth noting that it preceded the more famous and similarly themed Play That Funky Music, White Boy, it captures one of the most important chapters in U.S. cultural history. Lattimore had good reason to think that listeners would understand the racial surprise at the core of his song. In the 1960s and 70s, nothing symbolized the rift between black and white in the United States more than country music and soul music. Journalists and scholars celebrated soul as the aesthetic and economic property of African Americans, the absolute sound of blackness, and presented country, meanwhile, as the authentic voice of working class whites. Politicians and activists heralded soul as the expression of the civil rights and black power movements and described country as the soundtrack of white conservative backlash. Record labels, radio stations, and retailers used this language as a central part of their promotional strategies, tailoring country and soul releases to racially specific market segments. Listeners, too, embraced the dichotomy, and the supposed divide between the two genres became the basis for activism and even violent conflict from Mississippi to Senegal to Vietnam. To this day, whether in the pages of political journalism or on the stages of American Idol, country and soul remain ubiquitous markers of racial difference. Still, despite these perceptions, the two genres have shared roots. Not only did each draw from the same musical lineage, but they were intimately connected in the recording industry in the 60s and 70s. They were made by the same people, recorded in the same places, released by the same record companies. Indeed, even as the genres became opposites in the national consciousness, which Lattimore <coughs> and many others exploited, they were inextricably linked on the production level. And the key players in this process were an integrated cadre of studio players, songwriters, and producers. And my work attempts to tell their stories. I specifically explore the activities of musicians in Memphis and Nashville, Tennessee, and Muscle Shoals, Alabama, an interconnected recording economy that I term the country soul triangle. In the 60s and 70s, the musicians working in this triangle produced a vast catalog of popular and acclaimed recordings that brought international renown to studios like Stax and Fame and made each city's signature sound, the Memphis sound, Nashville sound, Muscle Shoals sound, a marker of quality and of authenticity. They won accolades from the national music industry, which heralded them as exemplars of professionalism and versatility, and from local civic leaders who championed them as politically and economically crucial to their respective communities. Even avowed segregationists like Memphis's mayor, Henry Loeb, championed interracial Southern music. Triangle musicians created hits for everyone from Bob Dylan to Bob Marley, 
but they were most identified with country, soul, and those genres, musical hybrids. Backing up everyone from Aretha Franklin to Hank Williams Jr., the musicians of the country soul triangle produced much of the period's most enduring and relevant music. They also, though, became a favorite metaphor for the contested state of the South and the United States in this turbulent period. Politicians, writers, and even the business community pointed to the triangle's commercial boom, cross-racial music, and integrated studios as a sign of economic renaissance and social progress. But those same politicians, writers, and business leaders also exploited the boundaries between country and soul by heralding them as oppositional expressions of racial authenticity and political purity. This seeming paradox defined a broader societal uncertainty about the continuing tension between interracial cooperation and racial division, which became perhaps the dominant debate in US racial politics in the era of civil rights, black power, and white backlash. Uh, I would argue it's still the dominant debate in American racial politics. The relationship between country and soul was thus America in microcosm. The Triangle's musicians stood at the center of this potent symbolism. They were the first to promote their recordings as symbols of racial integration. It was they, for example, who championed the interracial musical blends and transgressive potential of black country artists like Charlie Pride or white soul singers like the Box Tops. It was they who asserted that studios like Stax and its integrated house band Booker T and the MGs were symbols of integration's success. And they continued to play together interracially even as their music took on such wildly different racialized connotations. Conversely though, it was also these musicians who drove the genres apart, capitalizing on the era's polarization by making records that explicitly appealed to racially and politically divided audiences. They shaped the assertive soul of Aretha Franklin and the Staples Singers. They amplified the sounds of white backlash in the country of Merle Haggard and Hank Jr. And in fact, they specifically asserted a difference between country and soul as a prime example of the nation's racial divide. Uh, one fascinating Merle Haggard song called I'm a White Boy, uh, which was brilliantly written about by David Cantwell in his book about Merle Haggard, includes the line, country music, quote, is the only soul I need to fan my flame. They accompanied these records with a sensualist and even nationalist language and images in their ads and public statements reading some press releases and uh, articles about country music and soul music in the 60s, and you'd think that you were listening to one of the era's uh, politicians or activist groups. There's an article in 1968, for example, about Aretha Franklin on the cover of Time magazine that could, reads like it could have been written by Amiri Baraka. Some even made alliances with politicians, like Jesse Jackson or George Wallace. Through this era, triangle musicians both challenged and reinforced the racial perceptions surrounding their music, and crucially, made little attempt to reconcile that contradiction. In fact, that contradiction was the most important part of their job. Through their work, musicians of the country soul triangle became pivotal actors in the trajectory of US racial politics in the 20th century, both literally and figuratively producing the cultural markers of race that defined this watershed moment and reshaped the ways that people in the United States and throughout the world understood and articulated the supposed differences between black and white. There's a redneck in the soul band is thus a singular encapsulation of how the musicians who created country and soul reflected and directed the era's cultural narratives. Despite this, most discussions of the relationship between black and white musicians in the 60s and 70s South have focused specifically on soul music and have mostly presented integrated soul as an analogy for the national civil rights movement. Numerous writers, most influentially Peter Goralnik in his foundational book Sweet Soul Music, have celebrated these studios as embodiments of what Goralnik calls a quote, Southern dream of freedom. <coughs> 
that paralleled the push for integration and countered the ugly legacy of white supremacy. According to Guralnik and his many followers, this harmony ended in the late 1960s, when the rise of black power and the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. <clears throat> in Memphis intruded on those studios and destroyed the earlier spirit of cooperation, just as those events supposedly ruptured, ruptured the interracialism of the early movement. In other, in other words, there's a narrative about the civil rights movement that says that in the early 60s, black and white worked together, and then in the late 60s, that all fell apart. There is a, the same narrative is true in the way people talk about a particularly Southern soul. This version of civil rights movement history has been debunked, or at least helpfully complicated in a variety of ways. But it remains and retains its primacy in thinking about this crucial musical uh, aspect of the same period. This narrative is buttressed by two connected assertions. When you hear the story about integrated soul uh, being racially progressive until the late 1960s when it all falls apart, when you hear that narrative, they are, that narrative is usually accompanied by two things. First, Southern soul supposedly helped to redeem the white South from its racist past. In other words, white musicians or audience members heard black music and thus were redeemed from the ugly a history of white supremacy uh, that affected the South and the entire United States. That's first. The second connected assertion is that Southern studios were a <clears throat> racial oasis in which conflict and even racial identity and an awareness of racial identity supposedly did not even exist until the late 1960s when everything supposedly collapsed, right? This narrative remains at least a standard, if not the standard, interpretation of inter integrated Southern music and has also become a standard element to larger appreciations of Southern history in this period. You still hear this all the time. Still, to a large extent, this narrative is a fiction. Many of its claims are simply inaccurate. <clears throat> Others are vastly oversimplified. It ignores country music almost completely, and it brings down an artificial chronological boundary on Southern soul. Perhaps the most troubling problem, though, is that this narrative fundamentally represents, misrepresents the experiences of African Americans in the country's whole triangle. Despite these utopian claims, black musicians consistently voiced objections to mistreatment from whites and worked to equalize the racial dynamics of Southern studios. From the beginning, they challenged what they perceived as any number of slights, from the use of racial slurs in the studios to the unfair opportunities that white musicians and songwriters received. Now, sometimes this resulted in cataclysmic events, like the Aretha Franklin session in Muscle Shoals that collapsed due to perceived racial and sexual misconduct among white musicians. But sometimes it took a quieter form, like the firing of Booker T. and EMG's original black bassist, Louis Steinberg. Did you know Booker T and the MGs had a black bassist at the beginning? If you, a lot of places you won't hear about them. Yeah. By the late 1960s, these complaints fueled attempts to assert a soul culture that should be controlled economically and artistically by African Americans. As activist Booker Griffin wrote in 1971, there is a kind of music that is the folk music of black experience. If anyone should own it, it should be black people. And I love that quote, right, because he says it's the folk music of the black experience. It's culturally ours. If anyone should own it, it should be us, right? It's also our capital that we should control. These objections were not primarily due to external forces, although they certainly played a role in framing and fueling musicians' concerns. But instead, they were created by the specific racial politics of the music business. In response, black musicians resisted these practices on a day-to-day -day level, joining with activists both inside and outside the music business to launch wider campaigns. In this period, nearly every civil rights and black power organization launched campaigns to specifically equalize the black music business. Uh, the Congress for Racial Equality Corps even toyed with starting a record label to try to give African-American artists uh, a black controlled record organization. While powerful industry groups like the All Black National Association of Television and Radio Announcers, a really fascinating organization that has not 
been given its fair due, pushed the industry to confront these issues from within. This activism not only resulted in a massive increase in the number of black record executives, both in the South and elsewhere, huge exponential increase in the early 70s, but also a broader cementing of the music and concept of soul as a black signifier. In other words, it's because of this that the notion of soul music gains that kind of political traction within the business. These campaigns and their consequences have been lost in much of the scholarship, which credits whites with the racial breakthrough. It says when those white folks started playing music with black folks, that's when things were good. And then blames African Americans implicitly or explicitly for destroying the interracial magic. As soon as black people decided that they didn't want to play it right, it's always blaming the black people. White players are congratulated for having the courage and the vision to play music with black people, while African Americans are scolded for abandoning these sympathetic whites in favor of divisive racialist politics. A full examination of the country's soul triangle reveals a much richer and more complicated story. And that's the story I try to tell in the book. And to do so, I tried a somewhat different approach, uh, particularly from the way that this story has been told, which is to analyze these musicians as workers and their studios as working environments. I choose these, this labor-based analysis, which is still relatively uncommon in studies of popular music, because, number one, it corresponds much more directly with the way the musicians talk about themselves. If you talk to musicians, you're almost always going to have a conversation about their work, even down to things like how much money I made per session. right? And it also significantly demystifies this often romanticized story. The musicians understood themselves not as vessels of some kind of authentic racial identity or as symbols of a national civil rights movement, but as versatile professionals whose extensive training and hard work allowed them to play a wide variety of music and work across racial lines. This is not to suggest that the musicians didn't understand the impact of what they were doing. But it's important, I think, to understand how they spoke about themselves and understood themselves. They were craftspeople, not conduits, performing music and symbolism that were economically and politically advantageous. Indeed, contrary to essentialist notions about the racial character of soul music or country music, or ill-fitting analogies to the national push for civil rights, the experience of race in the country soul triangle was specifically determined by the work of making records. Oh, I think I, I forgot to include a slide of Arthur Alexander, so I, I, he, he'll accept my apologies when you imagine his face. As black singer-songwriter Arthur Alexander said, quote, we only had this one thing in common. We liked all types of music. Now, labor historians have shown us how integrated workplaces possess a site-specific set of racial practices that don't necessarily correspond to what's going on outside, right? That often there are things that happen in workspaces that are different. The recording studios of the Country Soul Triangle exhibited just such complexity, but they differed from most other integrated workspaces in one key respect. These were interracial work environments that were literally and figuratively producing the language of the era's racial divide. They were going into the studios to make records that by the end of the 60s were so deeply associated with a divided United States. Country and soul became internationally recognized shorthand for the distance between black and white. So the interactions of black and white musicians who created them also offers us a crucial addition to our understanding of integrated labor. After all, in There's a Redneck in the Soul Band, Lattimore explores the complexities of racial identity in the United States. How? By telling a story about musicians on the job. Perhaps the most important benefit of this different approach is that it illustrates that the racial partnership at the core of this music was fundamentally unequal. There is an assumption I think not only in scholarship, but just generally. There's, some, there's a real assumption 
that in the 1960s and 70s, the integration of Southern studios was somehow synonymous with racial equality, right? Or that there was something inherently racially progressive about the fact that black and white were making music together. But triangle musicians, both black and white, understood that records could be made interracially and still represent a society both separate and unequal. It had been that way since at least the beginning of the US recording business in the early 1900s when, as Carl Hagstrom Miller describes in his brilliant book, Segregating Sound, industry leaders created and policed a, quote, musical color line that paralleled and strengthened the rise of Jim Crow segregation. Country and soul were direct manifestations of that musical color line, and triangle musicians structured their work around their recognition of it, even or perhaps especially those who worked in integrated studios and who pursued musical crossover. Everybody understood the racial geography of their work. Of course, as usual, it was far easier to transcend the musical color line if you were white. In the 1960s and 70s, as in earlier eras, white musicians had far greater opportunity to move into black identified styles like soul, to cross over into soul and R&B, than their African-American colleagues did with white identified genres, especially country. And even though they, they defied segregation in important ways, some black musicians questioned and resisted the entry of whites into black identified musical spaces. White Memphis guitarist Bobby Manuel summed up the attitude of these African-American professionals as, quote, not another white boy over here. We're sick of this. African Americans did not, by and large, have the same access to white controlled environments, and even in soul music, sometimes lost professional opportunities to their white counterparts. Ultimately, this disparity created and defined the Triangle's larger historical trajectory. By the 1970s, musicians in Memphis, Muscle Shoals, and Nashville used soul to enrich, both creatively and financially, white people, white artists, white studio owners, white record executives, and white identified genres. Mainstream country artists from Charlie Rich, Dolly Parton, incorporated soul and even disco into their recordings. I have a lot of country disco recordings. <laughs> even George Jones made a disco recording. Yeah. I don't recommend you listen to it. <laughs> it exists. And there is, by the way, to be fair, there's some great country disco. Seriously. Dolly Parton, top of the list, right? In doing so, these artists were helped by many of the Triangle's white veterans of soul studios. Almost none of the black ones. But many of the white studio musicians who worked in Memphis and Muscle Shoals in the 1960s went to Nashville in the 1970s, hired specifically because of their experience with soul music. A new set of subgenres outlaw country and southern rock, embraced black music as a symbol of supposed liberation from the worlds of George Jones and George Wallace, even as the music remained as segregated as any sector of American pop, and even though they sometimes employed Confederate imagery in their songs and performances. <clears throat> Perhaps most significantly, though, Soul Studios increasingly rely on prominent sessions by white artists for revenue and cultural prominence. In this period, and this is, a, this is not the whole list, artists like Elvis Presley, Dusty Springfield, Cher, Paul Revere and the Raiders, Rod Stewart, Petula Clark, Herbie Mann, the Rolling Stones, Neil Diamond, Liza Minnelli, the Osmonds, Paul Simon, Brenda Lee, and many others traveled to the Country Soul Triangle specifically in order to make soul-influenced recordings. As Muscle Shoals producer and Fame Studios owner Rick Hall said, the Triangle's musicians became famous and rich for, quote, taking the white music and making it sound black. This process resulted in some amusing moments of racial confusion. Like when Paul Simon told his record company that he wanted to work with the Jamaican musicians who backed up the Staple Singers, not realizing that they were a bunch of white guys from Alabama. <laughs> but it also provoked fierce criticism from black musicians and observers who saw both racial appropriation and economic displacement in the changeover. This process accompanied a larger departure of black performers from southern studios 
and national recording contracts. Clarence Carter summed up this process when he recalled, quote, when those white guys started their studios in the, in the South, I don't think their aim was ever to stick with black music. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, white privilege, much more than black power, provoked the decline of Southern soul. The marginalization of black musicians has been reiterated in much of the scholarship and in popular memory. The focus has been primarily on white musicians. From Steve Cropper to, to Rick Hall, uh, who the entire Muscle Shoals documentary is framed around his personal journey, thus rendering many of their black colleagues secondary, passive, or even troublesome within the narrative. White musicians who, by the way, and this is, I think, very important to note, and if I went back to rewrite the book, or maybe even if I get to do another edition, I will really foreground this. These musicians who I'm talking about, these white musicians, are almost always men almost always, and I think that's really, really crucial. And I will critique my own book by saying that I did not talk about gender enough. They're almost always men. These white musicians are credited with developing innovative musical blends that demonstrated their <laughs> racial open-mindedness and ultimately helped liberate themselves, the South, and the nation. On the flip side, black Southerners are mischaracterized as authentic voices who influenced whites musically welcomed them in, them in and embraced them, helped them to become better people, and then either betrayed those white allies or conveniently faded into the background by the end of the next decade. Lattimore's song, thus, helps us get a glimpse into the racial ambivalence that lies at the core of this story, since it is about a black band inspiring a white guitarist to think differently about himself and become liberated. <clears throat> this ambivalence, the complexity at the core of this story, which I try to map out in the book, has been buried underneath a narrative of racial, and re racial reconciliation that has become central to U.S. cultural politics in the post-civil rights era, even now, in the era of Donald Trump. In recent decades, these musicians have been promoted as symbols of interracial cooperation and music as a space where the races have come together as equals and even friends. Uh, 2013's Accidental Racist, um, a terrible song that is also fascinating. And I love both Brad Paisley and LL Cool J, and I think they had good intentions, but wow. Um, that's one example of a much longer and more uh, diverse story. It's become central to nearly every aspect of the memory and marketing of Southern music. When knitted together, stories of racial, and co racial cooperation offer a kind of alternative historical narrative, a tradition of interaction that complicates or even contradicts conventional understandings of the South's racist past. Interracial musical collaborations from Jimmy Rogers and Louis Armstrong in the 1920s to Nellie and Tim McGraw in the 2000s are offered as counterpoints to racial polarization. The interracial intermingling of 1850s string bands or 1950s rock and roll becomes evidence for the limits of segregation and white supremacy. I just made that argument in a class that I visited earlier today. I contradict myself. I'm, I contain multitudes, that's right. And contemporary artists from white rapper Yellow Wolf to black country star Darius Rucker to interracial soul rock band The Alabama Shakes are all promoted as the latest participants in a continuum of cross-racial blending. Country and soul are a crucial element within this alternative narrative. Just as the genres became symbols for racial division, so too did images of the reunification become a potent metaphor from the 90s to today. Presidents from George H.W. Bush to Barack Obama used country and soul music to demonstrate their desire to transcend the blue state, red state divide. While numerous recording projects, including 1994's Rhythm and Country and Blues, which is a fantastic record if you haven't heard it, really fantastic, argued for the music's historical affinity. From the LA riots to the rise of the Tea Party, these partnerships seemingly affirmed the notion that country and soul and black and white musicians 
possessed a meaningful historical affinity. Now there is, without question, significant importance in the correct assertion that even in the worst days of racial turmoil, musicians in the South worked together to produce something that defied both the ideology and the practice of white supremacy. Don't get me wrong, this did happen and it was important. But those who promote this narrative, and there are <coughs> lots of us, from Barack Obama to me at some points in my career, have taken it further. Statements like racism did not exist in this studio, or on the bandstand everyone was the same, or we saw no difference between black and white, are still commonplace in this discourse. Southern musical spaces, both literal spaces and figurative spaces, have become an ahistorical interracial dreamland. This is a fallacy. Nothing mattered more to these musicians than race. Nothing structured their work more than their understanding and their deployment of racial category. And African Americans did not share equally in the benefits of a music that is now routinely heralded as a demonstration of racial progress. To remove race from their experiences is to ignore the painful reality and to deny the musicians rightful place as central and active contributors to the messy history of race and culture in the United States. Instead, they become an off-sited example in an insidious rhetoric that has taken hold in the post-civil rights years. In recent decades, interracial friendship has not only become a favorite defense against personal racism, the well-known but some of my best friends are black defense, but also the larger foundation to an argument that somehow suggests that individual relationships, friendships, or affection can either supersede or outright debunk deeper structural inequalities. The idea that if we somehow all hug each other, that police violence will no longer be an issue that we have to deal with. This idea, which sociologist Benjamin DeMott calls friendship ideology, fueled the backlash to the civil rights movement from the 70s to today by suggesting that black people have gone too far in their push for equality and opportunity. It's become crucial to the popular memory of US race relations, in which moments of interracial solidarity and particularly white involvement have become overemphasized and celebrated, while moments of racial solidarity are either minimized or demonized. We still see this with the difference between the way people think about the early movement and the black power years. And the same thing has thus happened to the story of the country soul triangle. <laughs> All right, it's rhythm country blues. It's Tanya Tucker and Little Richard. Um, great song. Uh, the privileging of interracial friendship in Southern music has disproportionately credited whites as racial progressives. Even in the many cases when black musicians have voiced significant complaints about their conduct. Black musicians, meanwhile, have been criticized and marginalized. In a sad echo of Confederate and segregationist apologists, the dominant narrative suggests that everything was fine in Southern music until outsiders showed up, black people got uppity, and alliances with whites were shattered. As with those larger narratives, the primary beneficiaries and heroes of this supposed colorblindness <coughs> are white people. And that is neither exceptional in U.S. history, nor is it a cause for celebration. 